panels that I've joined early on today is about how we kind of freeze some of the good stuff. You know, some of the some of the things that we've learned, particularly in 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 the COVID era period, uh, and how we take that learning going forward, and then how we embrace the same kind of thinking, and we don't slip back into into old behaviours and old old thinking uh, as we as we go forward. And, and I know you'll be you'll be on on top of that. Um, wrapping up, Emma, is there anything any, any last thoughts you want to share with us before we, we we hand over to our next speakers? No thoughts, but in the true nature of continuous improvement if any if anyone who has any thoughts feedback about what we could be doing um to develop this further then please do be in touch because i'm always willing to learn um and to have that feedback and support that's that's great emma so i'm gonna ask you just to drop your twitter handle in the chat maybe so if anybody wants to contact you via twitter and you've also got the uh, the quality improvement twitter account as well for for salisbury uh, which which I, uh, I follow and that's how i how i connected with you so um thanks for that great session emma um really interesting and um, be really interesting to see how that progresses so what i'll probably do i'll probably be in touch and we'll put a share up on fab stuff uh, website as well about the work that you're doing and i'll share these slides on the fab stuff website too if you if you don't mind if that's okay with you that's fine thanks ever so much for your time thank you Great, Emma. Thank you very much. Right, I'm going to hand back to Pete, uh, and he's going to hand us over to our next speakers. Brilliant. Thanks, Nick. And big thanks to Emma. We can feel the enthusiasm, the quality improvement enthusiasm oozing from your voice there. Uh, so, uh, great session. We're going to move on to the next session, and my colleague Tim Gillett, who's a senior improvement manager with ESYST, is going to introduce. Uh, an old friend of ESYST and mine uh, personally as well. So over to you, Tim. Thanks, Pete. Just on the sound check, can you hear me there? We can. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tim Gillett. Um, as Pete says, I work for ESYST. That's brilliant continuity announcement you're doing there, Pete. Keep up the keep up the good work. Um, I'm about to have a conversation with uh, Steve Christian. Steve is the Chief Operating Officer. We'll, we'll use the term coup for Chief Operating Officer, otherwise we'll be saying Chief Operating Officer for the next 20 minutes non-stop. Um, and Steve works, Steve's the coup at uh, Southport and Ormskirk up on the northwest coast, kind of above, above Liverpool, and he's a Liverpool football fan as well, but we'll not stray into that kind of territory. Steve, are you there? Steve? Unmute yourself. Yeah. You, you there, Steve? You'd, you'd think by now we'd mastered the art of uh, digitalization, wouldn't you? Yeah. Steve, afternoon. That, afternoon, mate. That's not happened at all during the last eight months, has it? Somebody coming on a call and having to be told to, to unmute themselves, has it? Um, no. So I'll, I'll commit to this session, Tim. If you don't talk about the derby, let's just leave that. Yeah. One there. Let, let's leave football. Let's leave. Let's leave football. It serves my purposes as well. It's great to see you, mate. Um, we want to Thank talk you. a bit about your life as a as a coup and what the experience has been like over the last six months or so, but generally what it's like to be a chief operating officer in the NHS. But you've got a bit of an interesting background, haven't you? I'm, I mean, you're incredibly young, Steve, aren't you? You know, and uh, I can't quite see your hair on there, but it has gone a little bit grey over the last year or two, which might be related to the coup role. But you're incredibly young and you've had a really interesting interesting career um, and you've got to, to where you wanted to get to. What's, tell us a bit about your background. Yeah, less about the grey hair. Um, I can't talk about that. hair, Steve. You go yeah, for it. Indeed, indeed. It was I went for a visit around our paediatric a &E this morning to see the guys, to see how they were. And one of the nurses, she was quietly whispering to a colleague, which I overheard, went, look what COVID's done to Steve. He's gone grey. <laughs> so that's what COVID's done to me on my journey. Um, in, in terms of background, just, just really, really sim simple. Um, graduate management trainee, um, post obviously um, you know formal education routes via university etc and then following the grad scheme I uh, went on to take a number of senior op operational roles across both commissioning and the provider landscape uh, I reached a point um, probably 10 years into my career uh, of, of sort of deputy director status with a view that at that stage I may then go into an executive role however I felt at that stage there was a need to broaden my portfolio and gain greater exposure and experience of the wider um, sort of landscape of health and care provision. So um, I, I, I sort of moved across into the regulatory um, sort of landscape uh, and within that specifically on service improvements. 
So uh, for five years, I worked with NHS England, with ESYST, uh, which were fond memories, uh, and then equally with the North region uh, under the leadership of Lynn Simpson at the time to support uh, service improvement and transformation. Uh, following that, I, uh, I, you know, an ambition was always to come back into the provider arm, uh, which I uh, took on the coup role at Southport and Ormskirk. And uh, two years to the day, um, I joined this organisation and, and, and still sit, sit in this office uh, here and now. Brilliant. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. So it's, I think something a lot of people have done that kind of route, haven't they? The traditional up route and then moving out of the provider world. I mean, I, you know, I did that too. That's kind of an interesting thing and gives you lots of different exposure. And like you say, in teams like ESIST and the regional teams, you get to see lots of different organisations, different setups, different cultures. But particularly, I'm particularly interested in your work in improvement, Steve. So, you know, knowing the work that, that you did with ESIS, but then absolutely fantastic work as well with the North region, particularly on urgent care, bringing teams together, the action on A&E programme that you chaired and coordinated was just fantastic stuff. How did that move out of the provider world into improvement? How did that kind of change you and form you and help you in terms of the, the, the role you're in now? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, for me, and I'm going to, I'm going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to just talk to this. I suppose what one of the key elements, um, it was with Pete Gordon, actually, that Pete and I connected up with um, a, 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 a professional that we all know in Helen Bevan. And uh, through my improvement sort of um, period with NHSE, there was one thing that re really stayed true with me and it really uh, shaped and redefined my leadership and my, my approach uh, in leading teams. And, and that was sort of understanding new power, um, new power currency. Um, and if colleagues aren't aware of that, I, I'd absolutely advise and recommend um, having a look at that um, publication. It's, it's the author's Henry Timms. And essentially what, what new power is, it's a shift of sort of leadership approaches in terms of sort of that top down hierarchical uh, method. To more of a, a shared, open, inclusive, and participatory, participatory one. Um, so, so if we just go into that, all, all power, and this is what I see within my NHS career before I moved into improvement. Uh, I, I need I noted leadership styles of sort of institutionalization. It was very sort of transactional, uh, command and control, and, and top down and quite closed. So it was it was for the few rather than the many. Whereas when I got into the into the, the notion of, of, of working with sort of the improvement and transformation leads of the health sector, new power was um, introduced to me, which was more about rather than controlling power, more about channeling it as a current. Um, and it was more about sort of shared principles, um, looking at sort of a um, word that Helen used was radical uh, transparency, building uh, rapport and relationships, uh, creating power for many, not few, uh, and, and pulling it in. So creating sort of social movements and coalitions rather than sort of creating hierarchy and, and, and sort of controlled environments. So 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 throughout my improvement um, uh, sort of career and then moving into the coup, coup role, I really challenged myself and my, my approach to start thinking about new power rather than sort of old power. Um, and, and that got me sort of working on sort of different types of uh, approaches. And I think before I went into improvement, I was very much uh, a senior leader that almost came across as a firefighter. So, you know, I felt it was my duty and, and my, my daily uh, sort of task was to just put out fires um, and take that sort of hero approach. Um, and that's, I, that, I, I, and, and, I did exactly yeah. that. My, you know, my... So, my similar to yours, but it gives you a kick, doesn't it? It gives you a hit, it gives you a satisfaction. Oh, you're you, you, you high five at the end of the day thinking you've achieved something, where yeah. actually it's pretty transactional, it doesn't achieve a great deal. And I think we've, we've really learning that new power um, mindset and leadership quality. It started getting me to think more about, rather than be a firefighter, what, what, what type of char character would you want to set yourself up as? And I've started to build build myself up as a farmer. <laughs> um, that and that, yeah. that, that's more about, yeah, setting sort of the right conditions to allow what I would call your people, um, your harvest, your crops, to, to nurture, grow, and, and realise their true potential. So again, back to new power, 
it's about that sort of building the relationships and and, and making it with, with a shared network and and and, and, and really creating the right conditions for, to deliver sustainable improvements. Whereas as a firefighter, I wasn't building those conditions. I was just reacting and being quite transactional. So that firefighter to farmer um, transition in terms of my leadership through the experience of going through the e-improvement um, sort of portfolio has really, I think, helped me and set me up to be the most effective coup that I can possibly be. Um, I think last point on this, and we will move on, is I think it's also changed my perception in terms of how I should act as a leader to my team to influence and bring about positive change that's sustainable. So um, I think previously I would I would almost over plan. Uh, I'd set project groups up and create sort of governance and bureaucracy where we just couldn't get anything through the line, over the line. Whereas now I really try and develop conditions again whereby we give permission and time uh, to allow our clinical experts to give things a go uh, and, and build those conditions where people don't need to ask for permission really um, they, they've got the autonomy to go for it and, I, and I'll, I'll hold them by it to account but I'll hold them uh, and, and work and support them every step of the way I'll, I'll leave that's that quite there brave, though, isn't it Steve that's quite a, yeah it's, it's fascinating stuff you know I agree with you know and familiar with the stuff that you talked about but to actually do that in the real world it's easy for us or a bit at arm's length to 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 kind of to advocate for those kind of approaches but to take it on in the radical way that you have at Southport and Ormskirk is quite a brave thing to do isn't it when there's all the drive for improvement there's a drive for performance as, as, as lots of organizations you, yours is a fairly small trust isn't it and, and has the challenges that that brings in terms of recruitment retention balancing performance your little shifts in numbers can make a big difference if it, did it feel like a brave thing to do or was it just just the way you were going to do it anyway um it was the way i was going to do things um uh, and i suppose I had to choose carefully which what the right the right organization for me more as well as the organization and being right for the organization and that's important in any in any process isn't it that you've got to you've got to be able to align yourself to the corporate values visions and aspirations of the organization what was really positive for me is there was a catalyst for change um two years ago to the day it was a challenge provided in special measures um and only um last week We've had the formal announcement that we're coming out of uh, challenge provider status, which is excellent and a massive accolade uh, to the great work from the teams of this organization. And uh, it was the it was the people of the organization that allowed me to be the farmer and not the firefighter and go with the flow. Um, and, and with that, we've really developed a, a, a different way of doing things here in terms of culture um, and behavior that work very true to the value base that we, we've committed to here in, in, in scope values. I won't go through that, don't test me. Um, so I suppose I was given permission by the chief exec to um, give this a go. But more importantly, um, I developed a coalition around me that truly believed that this was the right approach. And the clinical experts who are the people that drive the change really brought into this. Um, and by co-design, and working in, in in that in that sort of coalition effort, uh, we've really demonstrated that it can be done. And, and, and I think the notion of coming out with challenge provider status is, is an evidence base of that. That's fabulous to hear. Fabulous. In terms of kind of to bring it into the, the current COVID situation and and the challenges that you've placed you've experienced in 2020 and, and the inevitability of you know to move into to what's looking increasingly like wave two and is is, is really wave two. How's, how's that yeah. been working as a coup in, in, in this year, which has been completely different, with different challenges to every year that we've had? Yeah, um, another good question. Uh, one that I'm not prepared for. Um, so You'd write for me, and give it your yeah, Steve. <laughs> me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, you get me back, Tim. Um, I'm yeah. gonna talk about personal endeavor and resilience. Um, as a leader, you know, people look to you, don't you, to have the answers and to be the one who's, who's, who's showing strength and confidence and conviction at, at times of, of, of challenge. And I think what I've I've encouraged myself to do, and I think uh, and my team around me, is to accept and be vulnerable. Um, we've all not got the answers. And actually by working together and being open and honest on that and, and, and really... Um, Allowing us to be vulnerable with each other as a team has really um, allowed us to, to, to get the best out of each other over this really difficult time. So vulnerability and leadership is something that I would encourage and something that's really uh, 
put me well in, in this in this last six months because being vulnerable allows you to develop the real relationships that are underpinned by trust um, and honesty and openness. Uh, a second area to that is, is resilience outside of work. So you've got to have a good network around you and utilize and capitalize on that. So, you know, I've got two young ones and a wife uh, and they've been supportive throughout this. And I can't, you know, they, they've been my backbone and they, they've kept me going. So, you know, um, I've made sure that when the schools were open at least once a week, I've took my kids to school. And that's important for them, but equally more so for myself. It makes it keep it makes me positive and it keeps me in good moods as I go into work. Um, and equally, I, I test out ideas with my two kids, and believe it or not, five year old or four year old have got better answers than me, and they come up with the solutions. So, testing myself out with my kids is fantastic, actually. But taking the kids to school once a week has been invaluable, and and more importantly, keeping up keeping up with routine. So, go in the gym. Um, and also I, I coach an under six football team and um, I was going to let that go at the start of COVID, but I made a commitment to keep going and it's, it's been, it's been fantastic. Um, so, so keep, keep it consistent in what you do outside work, support your pe personal resilience in work is a, is a key um, sort of um, message I would, I would take on this. And the last thing on okay, that that's is, really brave, Steve. Yeah. Yeah. The last thing, the third point on this one is, um, you're always in the hustle and bustle here in goal command and supporting the team. But I've made an effort again to take time out. So I take 20 minutes out, regardless of what I'm doing and where we're up to, to go for a walk, get some open space and just reflect. Um, and I've continued that. And, and when I see others struggling and they've had a difficult day, guess what? They come on the walk with me and we talk about things outside of work. But when we talk about things outside of work, you can connect those issues, those those discussions with work-related practice and we get our best ideas and solutions through that time that we have um so yeah three 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 examples there that i hope uh, resonate with colleagues that's really good to hear Stephen. i think that's fantastic advice that people can uh, can people take can really take something away from and i think that relates back to the, the talk of new power doesn't it and you know we talked a bit about bravery and again i was thinking what you're saying there was really brave but not in that traditional male macho kind of way and we're both big butch blokes aren't we so we could really get drawn into the macho side of bravery but actually the bravery to be vulnerable and the and to have the the, the humility i guess and and the confidence to a point to be able to say look i've not got all the answers here we you know we've got the answers our brains are, are, are greater together aren't they than 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 yeah. anyone individual and it, it's not really it doesn't build resilience in a system does it to have to have to go to one person for the answer all the time when actually true leadership in, in, in the modern sense that we want, that people like us want to do it is, is really about empowering your teams and thinking like a farmer and, and nurturing your crops and, and, and what have you and, and watering and feeding and all those things that, that come on all those great slides. So, so absolutely, absolutely fascinating stuff this, Steve. We've, we've, we've only got another four minutes, so I'll, I will, um, I'll, I'll just ask you one more question. Um, well, a couple more questions, I guess. One, one of the things I'm interested in is, you know, is ops teams and things like site management, coups, general managers. You know, we, we talk about the front line, don't we, the NHS or the media does. And we all know, those of us working here, that this is a team sport, isn't it? And I think a lot of us potentially who don't work on the front line anymore have felt a bit, a bit fraudulent to a degree and that we've, we're not quite contributing in the same way. And when people clap for the NHS and carers, it's been about nurses and doctors and therapists and other allied health professionals and social workers who are doing the, the doing. What's been the contribution of the ops teams, of your general managers, of your site teams and people like that? Invaluable. Um, and, and I think what, what's fascinating is actually a, a measure of that is that the clinical teams uh, all wrote out to our operational management team to thank them and, and acknowledge their work ethic. Um, you know, the ops teams working with the teams keep, keep the hospital safe uh, and and they're, 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 they've been invaluable in, in this effort. And I think just to give an example of that, it's the simple stuff that you don't think about in terms of redeployments. So they've, they've led on the redeployment strategy. We've had really cha real challenges in terms of um, patient visiting restrictions. And the ops teams have been putting methodologies and practices in place to ensure that we can connect with our wider communities where we've had to restrict the, tr tr the traditional working arrangements. So in invaluable, e equally, um, through patient flow, you know, we've set up different ways in which we, we manage the flows. And again, I won't go through the examples, but I can offer loads out 
whereby the team have stepped up uh, and, and demonstrated their contribution towards the COVID effort through a number of different ways, but importantly, through patient in, uh, staff wellness and well-being, and also patient engagement and, and experience. And there's many examples which I'd be really happy to share. But the testament to the ops team is they've been recognised and acknowledged by the clinical teams. And that's always good, isn't it? I think that's always a testament, isn't it? If, if you get that recognition of the contribution that, the, that they're making from your clinical teams, that's a, that's praise indeed. And a practical example, just to give one side, because I'm conscious of time, is just world liaison officers. So the ops team yeah. came in and stepped in when there was issues in staffing gap pr provision, where the team will come and be a WLO and support with the ward in terms of administration, which again is just a, a classic practical example where teams stepped up and redeployed into the areas that needed, needed their help. And brilliant as well, the World Liaison Officer role for the teams who are doing it. So if you're from HR or finance, for example, to see firsthand the clinical services that you're supporting and really helps to understand the contribution that you can make as well, doesn't it? That's brilliant. Steve, we could have talked. I've got a load of questions here that we've not got to, and I, I kind of hoped and knew that would be the case. It's been brilliant to chat with you. We could have done an hour quite easily, couldn't we? A lot of take home messages there, particularly for me around you know the new power stuff let's really urge people there's some there's some links in the chat box that people can use to get to the new power stuff and that point about brave leadership isn't what people would have traditionally thought it was it's the bravery to be vulnerable yeah. the bravery to take time for yourself as well last word for you steve think like a farmer not a firefighter Brilliant. Thanks so much for your time. I hope you have a good rest you of the day. Take, uh, I hope colleagues are well. Uh, thanks, Tim, for that. Re re really good. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Cheers, Steve. Pete, back to you, back to our compact. Brilliant. Uh, that was a great session. A uh, big thanks to uh, uh, Steve. If you're still on, I won't mention the football, the Villa Liverpool result. But uh, what a great inspirational talk uh, from a chief operating officer who's destined uh, in the near future to be a brilliant uh, chief executive. So many thanks, Tim, and absolute, uh, really grateful to you, Tim, and Steve, sorry. Um, so we're going to move on to our next session now, and uh, Nick Holding uh, is going to introduce uh, that session. Uh, Nick, are you there? Yeah, thanks, Pete. I mean, it's not going to be much of me this time. I'm going to hand straight over to uh, Barath and Ben with a quick, quick introduction. Um, just going to check, check they're both on. I know Ben's rushed out of a, a clinical meeting at the moment. Ben, are you with us? Barath, are you there? I'm here, Nick. This is Barath here. Oh, fabulous. Ben, are you with us? Can you hear now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Fabulous. Good, yeah. okay. Off mute. So, so uh, we've got... Uh, Barath Lakapa, who's a consultant geriatrician from Northamptonshire, and uh, Ben Owen, who's an ED consultant from Sherwood Forest Hospital in, in Mansfield. So these, these two have done a double act for as long as I've been in the ECIST, and I've, and I've seen them many, many times talking about this particular subject, and it's how we embrace risk. But uh, I've asked them this time to think about how we, how we em embrace risk in the, uh, over the COVID era, when we first thought about this, this was this was before we started seeing the increase in numbers. So it was it was more of a reflection, but now it, it almost seems like more of a perspective view as well as we as we move forward. So I'm going to hand the floor over to to these two because I know they're going to fill the session uh, very very well. I'll keep an eye on time, but Ben Barath, over to you. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Nick. Um, I says we wanted to talk about um, first of all why this matters. I think. Um, in emergency care um, and also um, obviously COVID is particularly high risk with the frail elderly. Um, Barasta geriatrician, I'm an ED consultant and um, crowding in EDs, crowding in hospitals, excessive length of stay has always had a risk for patients. Um, that's never gone away and risk of admission, there's a risk of other hospital infection, there's a risk of deconditioning and all those things have always mattered to frail old people particularly but to all patients. Um, all that COVID has done is made that worse um, and actually so it's meant that we have to manage our patients risks even more clearly and more carefully um, and and the, the fact of the matter is and we, we, we I talk to my staff now and say um, for, for every frail old person who gets COVID um, through a mission to hospital um, or through co contact with a healthcare professional one in five will die and that's a really powerful message uh, that actually um, 
doing our job well and managing them and what their expectations are and being honest with them is always important. That's just even more important now. Um, and Brath got a statistic um, around hospital acquired infection as well as to why that why this is so important. It's uh, really uh, scary for the only reasons as we're seeing these tier three and then lo local lockdowns. But one of the statistics which came out most recently, a couple, of, I think it was a week and a half ago, was 25% of the COVID uh, infections of the frail elderly was actually acquired in hospital in Wales. So that's really a scary number. These patients came in for different reasons, but because of the frailty and increased risk, they seem to have acquired COVID in the hospital. And that's the statistics, uh, Ben, just to add to what you were talking about before. Cool, thanks. And, and we were and we were talking about how the language we use is really important. Um, and that there's risk everywhere everywhere you look. There's not people talk about I, I want my ward to be safe, my hospital to be safe. Um, and actually we can't promise safe to anyone because there's a risk in everything we do. There's a risk in coming to hospital, there's a risk in not coming to hospital. And actually this is about um, there is there is no safe, there is no no risk scenario. This is about a balance of risks. Um, and that balance of risk is different for every patient and for every situation. And that will change depending on what is wrong with them. And actually now, even more so probably, that will change depending on the level of um, COVID in the community and, and the hospitals. Um, and therefore, we've got to do that. We've got to talk to our patients. Um, but it's the concept, actually, we just think slightly differently. We're very good in healthcare at talking about, is it safe or not? Uh, and that question doesn't, there isn't really a sensible answer to that. It's actually about, are we in a, is it a low risk, medium risk, high risk scenario for, for the system and for patients? Um, and really about this is about um, in urgent care, uh, the risk of tr cross transmission is really around your, your attention to detail around PPE and seeing people you have to see, but also not seeing people doing things you don't have to do. And that's a balance now we have to strike. Um, but also it's the thing of um, crowding is a real risk, both in emergency departments, um, in care homes um, and also in inpatient beds. And actually, it's about thinking about how we do our job in the most efficient way possible, how we minimise admissions, and that's becoming even more important, how we minimise the time people spend in emergency departments, our pathways are working well, but also in inpatient beds, um, thinking, can this be done in the community? Can this be done um, if they are admitted? Can they be managed within a couple of days in the community? How do I identify those for early discharge? And we, we saw with the first lockdown how everyone had um, we managed to empty the hospitals quite quickly. Um, we also saw ramp rampant transmission within care homes at times. Um, and we don't know the answer to all those questions as what is right and wrong. We do know that crowding is down to two things. How many people come through the door and how long they spend in any given area like an emergency department or, or a hospital. So you can do two things. You can reduce the number of people coming in in an appropriate way and you can reduce the amount of time they spend in there. Um, other than that, and your PPE. Um, what community approaches um, would you look at, Barath, in terms of um, admitting people or deciding around frail elderly in hospital? I mean, there are two things. For us, when you look at a frail elderly person coming in, we just need to understand the reality of the situation right now. When they come into the hospital, we are talking about people in masks. They're in space like gowns. Some of them have got respirators on. Some of them also have visors on. And these are frail elderly. <clears throat> around about one in five of 85 plus will have some kind of mild cognitive impairment or neurodegenerative condition. So these patients instantly can't hear, can't look, they can't see, and they're scared. And it starts coming up as when you start taking history, if they can't hear you, the confusion increases. So in instantly the patient is classified as delirium or confusion, a bit unfair. So the next risk when you look at the patient that if you think it's safe for the patient because they, uh, there is some element you want to keep them in, if there is necessity, that's fine. If you don't think there's necessity, the false risk increases just by getting into the hospital. The other thing for them is the minute they're admitted for more than a day, their risk of falls increases when they go back home as well. So it doesn't really stop at just admission being safe. The fracture neck of femur risk increases because most of the falls which happen in hospital, 50% will have fracture neck of femurs. And then when you look at what we're going to be doing if the patient doesn't need to be in hospital is we keep them in bed for nearly 93% of the time they're there. There's lots of gyrocopic studies which have shown that patients don't mobilize or they just plain horizontal in bed. So before we send somebody in, I think we do need to think of the risks of deconditioning and other things of them. The element right now what we face is we patients are refusing to come in as much as we can, but 
We use guidelines similar to everybody else. And use two for sepsis or patient has got fast or chest pain. And if they're really appropriate, then we do take that call of getting them in. The biggest aspect for us is if we are asking for tests to be done and then being brought out, if they don't come out, then they get sucked into the hospital system and the difficulty they face is getting out of the system. That is one of the big risks we face. Then the other thing is them being informed about the risk is quite important. How do we get them to understand the risk is where the a and &E folk come in, where you are able to explain to them or people need to understand as they're really informed about the risk of an admission. Right, I think you can lost. Um, I think he just his connections just dropped out, so I'm just going to make him a co-host again. Okay. <clears throat> um, oh. To the point of how do you inform the patient of admission avoidance risk when they come into hospital? Because we do send some patients in to get investigations done, and then they need to come out as soon as we can. But people need to be informed of the risk, as you rightly said before. There's no safe risk and no risk, so. How do we go from there in the A and E? I think Ben's having a bit of trouble. That's okay. Uh, I can continue with a few things which we discuss Russ, and review with. Yeah. Russ, what's your, so you, you've asked a question, so I'm going to sort of bounce it back to you. Is it, have you got any thoughts on that in particular? Yes, absolutely spot on. I mean. If we think of admission avoidance as admission avoidance, I think it's a bit unfair term. The main thing we need to discuss is whether the patient is getting the best out of what we are trying to look for. Are we trying to make them safe in a way that they can function and then be more independent? So we simply ask a few questions. So if you're an A&E doctor or a geriatrician, or if you're anybody in the world junior doctor, you've got to ask simple questions. The simple questions you usually ask is, is the activities of daily living recoverable or is it need some assistance and can that be done at home? That should be one of the first questions because eating, drinking, washing and able to mobilize to the toilet. If they can do that, they should be doing it at home. The second aspect we look for is medication and meals. We try to keep it as simple as possible and uh, to eliminate risks for these patients. So if they can take the medications, if there's help from family members, neighbors, especially in COVID time, you get unlucky if they can't mix in households. So that's a different change we can look at. Telephone advice from family members. We can ask uh, uh, people to call in to see if they're taking their medications. The other aspect is if there are sufficient and willing caregivers. Families have made bubbles now, so if they can help out the patients at home, that should be thought of prior to anything else. The biggest thing everybody works about is the safety at home. I mean, what we need to understand is we've got patients, family members who know them for a long time, a collateral history of saying the safety. But it's a bit unfair to say somebody's not safe at home if somebody's 98 and they've lived there for 50 years. They've been safe for 50 years, so what else can we add to or decrease their risk? I mean, they've been living. Some people even walk up and down the stairs on the backside, which if you, if you ask him how many years have we done? Yeah, 22, 23. The last one was 15 years, and you wonder where the calluses came from. So I think asking and talking to the patient is a, a starting point. And the other aspect is, yes, uh, we do required to make that assessment is really home monitoring required. Does a nurse need to go in? Okay, if they want to do their blood pressure checks, or do you think that the chest infection is clearing up? Or if in some places where we have oxygen saturation sent out, just in case they came with the infection, they're negative for COVID on the swab, but they still could be the true or false negative. So they can go home with saturations and then can be followed up. Do they need the physiotherapy, occupational therapy if they're false patient, or if there's any rapid response social care? So we can do all those asks to yourself first and then look at the patient in front of you and then ask if the patient is safe actually to come in. Yes, aren't they actually safe to go home? And that should be one of the biggest questions you ask yourselves. The follow-up with primary care, it's easy to say you need follow-up for primary care. It's easy to say we need blood tests, but is it going to add value to the patient? The difficulty is if you want blood tests to be done right now, uh, patients don't want to go into hospital to phlebotomy. Some phlebotomy places have got change procedures. If you're going to send a district nurse, community nurse, or phlebotomist in, do you really require that patient to be exposed to that risk of a healthcare professional? Those are the simple things we can ask ourselves. And those are the things I would ask myself, and that's what we do in our training and teaching our uh, staff over here. But 
how do you implement that for each patient is actually explaining the risk to that patient. If they can be done at home, they're better off at home. That's what I would think, and that's how the thinking should be, Nick. I think Ben's back on now. Did you want to pick up another? Yeah, thanks. Um, apologies for that. Um, this, for me, is looking at... Um, uh, also, w w people that do need to come into hospital, it's how we do it in the best possible way. So we shouldn't hold people in emergency departments pending COVID swabs and things. The longer they stay in their ED, the greater the risk of uh, non-secoval infection. Um, if you if you infect within your ED and you bring someone into the hospital, then actually what you're doing is seeding the whole hospital. So it's really important we have pathways that get people through the emergency department quickly. We get people um, who, um, it, through on pathways that work quickly. We don't hold people for unnecessary reasons. We don't use ED when we don't need to. So um, it's making sure those that come in, when, when they're ready to go in, they come in. If there are other pathways in, you don't, other specialities don't default to ED. So this is all doing the basics as well. Your internal professional standards, making sure people see the right clinician first time. It's just become even more important. I think access for emergency departments and other specialties to specialty advice has been shown to both reduce admission but also reduce length of stay. So getting someone in the right bed first time um, and actually um, getting senior involvement early on, making sure people are seen within a timely fashion, particularly by consultants when they're admitted to hospital and seen on a daily basis. And there are clear plans that are around um, planning for discharge for admission. It's not a complete surprise. It shouldn't be a complete surprise on the day of discharge that someone needs some other social care input. It's usually pretty obvious from the very start. So planning that stuff from the day they arrive to hospital can make a real difference to people generally, um, but particularly more so at the moment. Um, and I think um, it's how we escalate that, how we challenge each other. Um, what COVID did show us is how well we can work together as a system. Um, and actually part of this is how we seize those good things, that, that goodwill, but also how we seize those good ideas and things that work really well in COVID that speeded up flow, avoided emissions, that they carry on. If it worked well in COVID, it's probably something we should keep doing full stop. Um, we don't stop doing it because there's no longer a lockdown. If it was good for patients, it, out of adversity comes opportunity and there's opportunity here to improve our processes even more um the key thing is how we tackle each other as well so people saying things like i'm risk averse or it's not safe to admit that patient to my area unless i know they're a negative swab what you're really saying is someone saying that is actually saying i'm happy for that patient to sit in the area you're in and risk cross the other patients but not my patients. We're all responsible for all our patients and all our actions, and that's never changed. But saying, I'm not bringing them in yet until I've got a negative swab for this area, just means they're sitting in another area. If they're positive, they're positive. And actually the risk of cross-infection is the same wherever they are. So you're not reducing that patient's risk and you're not reducing other patients' risk by holding them somewhere. If they come into your wall, we need good processes and good things to get them into hospital. Um, and we need to work together. Likewise, when we're discharging people, we really need to work really well with places like care homes and care agencies. When we're getting people home, it's communicating those that are positive and negative for COVID really well with the care homes. It's about making sure that when they do go back to the care homes or into other ward areas, we know who's been swabbed, who's not been swabbed. And actually making sure we don't do make mistakes like someone has a positive swab in the community three days earlier, then has a negative swab, it doesn't go down. Are oh, they negative? Actually, well, if they've been positive once, we have to assume they're positive now. We can't make that thing. So again, it's a lot of it. This is about, again, attention to detail and really good communication. And it's how we can improve that communication between hospitals and community on discharge and also for mission avoidance. Any further thoughts on that, Barath, on how we can improve yeah. discharge coordination? I think the biggest fear everybody is that if they go home, they won't be reviewed. But you do have community services, nursing, and patients can be reviewed according to their needs. Some places also are using oxygen saturation uh, <coughs> pulse oximeters as well. So the residential nursing homes, better coordination with their advanced care planning, which has already been in place. And if possible, getting the palliative care teams involved, if you think that the patient is extremely frail and they've already got an advanced player and escalation and ceiling of care. So I think it's a little bit more talking. To, we did it amazingly well in the start of COVID, and I think we can still do it. We can. I think the difficulty we face is we are looking at risk in a different way. We're not looking at risk for that patient. Admission, if it's not necessary, it's much, much more riskier than admitting them. So the frail patient, as you rightly said in the very beginning, one in five has a chance of dying from COVID if they come in. 
So that is where we need to be thinking of is if they don't need to come in, what else can we add in the community? But keeping to the basics, asking them if anything is needed in the community, if we can, that will be fine. But majority of the time we fail to ask their own family members who can help. And that might be the first step we need to do. Parath, I'm just going to jump in. We've got two minutes left before we have to hand back to, to P. Fascinating discussion. And that is something that um, you know, we've talked about a lot before and a lot of interest in. Is there anything any from either of you, just final words to, to leave people with? Any messages you want to for people to take away? I mean, I mean for me, it's, about, it's that thing of whatever we do for one individual patient affects other patients as well. Um, and actually holding people up in the system we need to come in is never beneficial to, to, to usually the, the other patients or that patient. Likewise, admitting someone who perhaps didn't need a mission is usually never beneficial to that patient and certainly not beneficial to others. So it's have that wider system view. And I think it's talking to patients about the risks. We don't, we talk about the risk, we worry about the risk of discharge. We don't talk about the risk of admission. And, and honest conversation with patients usually comes to the right outcome. Um, and better communication with, between care homes, hospitals, community teams, will always lead to better outcomes for patients and better decision making. So uh, and just do the basics well. Brilliant. Yeah. And the biggest advice. The other risk sorry, sorry Nick, last one sentence. The other risk is patients right now when they admit it, they don't have any visitors. Psychologically they are really, really poor with the support network. I mean patients with dementia, they can't have any visitors as well. So I think risk of admission needs to be really weighed in and the risk for that patient, not for the risk for the system or for the A and E or for the it's uh, for the unit which you're, or for yourself, it's, it should be put across as a risk for the patient. Mm, brilliant. Thank you, guys. That was a really interesting uh, short chat. And uh, we have got some uh, videos on our YouTube channel with these two guys talking more about uh, embracing risk. And uh, I'm sure we'll get them back again for a, for another chat, a bit, of a bit of a longer chat next time. But thank you, guys. Really appreciate your time. I'm going to hand back to Pete. Brilliant. Thank thanks, Nick. And uh, thanks to Sever, Brath and Ben. And if uh, you ever get a chance to see these guys live uh, when they're, you know, not on the screen, uh, they are impressive and they live and breathe this stuff in their daily lives as uh, an ED consultant, as a community uh, geriatrician. So big thanks there.